Thank you, good afternoon, Vice-Chancellor and distinguished guests, and thank you for the, the tie comment. I must admit it is, it is slightly different from what I normally wear. Um, as excited as I am to be here, and I, I genuinely am, um, I must confess, confess to be a little bit trepidatious following an invitation from Susie that included a byline, don't worry, you'll only be following Professor Ian Chubb. And <laughs> as far as I am from being Australia's next chief scientist, I think, I think that some of, our, some of our stories may be similar, and the message is somewhat similar in that what is it we can do to capture our students' imagination and engage with them at a far more meaningful level than what we currently do? So the story I'm about to share with you shows the journey that built environment engineering has taken over recent years to enhance the student engagement and to try and develop a much more positive learning experience for the students. But as Susie said, this is told from my own perspective as both a laboratory manager and an educator in the faculty, but moreover someone who's deeply passionate about the experiences and the legacies that we leave for our students. So our journey is underpinned by a very simple formula. An activity plus the space creates a student learning experience. And the whole notion of including space in this sort of formula starts to contextualise how important it is to look at the entire experience, not just the activity alone, which we sometimes tend to do. And our story starts here. This is a, a vision synonymous with many laboratory learning environments. A, a small group of students huddled in a dark, dirty corner surrounding some sort of teaching apparatus with a content expert who's just about to unleash his knowledge and tell them the secrets that lie within. And although we've taken some liberty with our friends here at Hogwarts, it's reasonable and it, it's quite distinct to see some um, similarities develop between our own environments and those that we see here. Just like Hogwarts has long, dark, distant corridors, so too did we. <laughs> In fact, the, er the areas were so congested that it was quite difficult to find anyone or anything. But more importantly, we had accumulated over 30 years' worth of artefacts that were making it incredibly difficult to run any sort of activity or event in the area. And you can imagine for the students, this was quite confronting. So for first year students who were first time in the laboratory, they would, they would try to do everything they could to not come back to the environments unless they absolutely, <laughs> unless they absolutely had to for a teaching and learning event. And this was a massive lost opportunity because these areas are the ones that we're trying to engage the students. So let's look at first at the space transformation. In preparation for the science and technology precinct, the university undertook a program to redevelop these spaces based on three underlying principles, transparency, flexibility, and socially engaging learning spaces. And this was the result. So this area, which is known as the Garden Lounge, is a social space that's open to any student in the university to do all of those sorts of things that you're not generally allowed to do in a laboratory environment. Eat, drink, wear thongs, have a good time, all those sorts of things they can now do here. But the important thing is the connection between the spaces. We're now a social space that's visually and physically connected to a learning environment. And that's key because what we're trying to achieve is to create and share the experience between those two areas. So to create the excitement and for the students outside to see what's happening, to be excited about what they might be doing in those spaces. You can see when we go into these laboratories how the flexibility's been developed. Obviously all the fixed equipment has now gone and we've got large open spaces with flexibility. We've got tables on wheels, chairs on wheels, and the ability to reconfigure these spaces in seconds is now almost infinite, whereas before it would be log a job and wait 12 months for it to be manufactured. And it doesn't matter where we go through these spaces, it's the same sort of feel. So we've got tables and chairs on wheels, we can reconfigure it, but all of it will only work with the support of all the services you can see hanging from the roof and the walls. Power, water, air, anything we can put in there to make sure that we can plug in any, exper any experiment in almost any space. But flexibility is more than just tables and chairs on wheels. Uh, the ability and one of the biggest challenges in engineering is how do you store things that go with these equipment? And in the past we would have seen lots of the brown built cupboards, we would have seen lots of things stored and we did in the earlier photos see things stored in the middle of laboratories. But now at the right hand side there you can see some white underbench units. They seem really simple but they've revolutionised how we operate. We're now able to store things with devices and take them around and move them when we go somewhere. We're able to give these to students to store their own projects in and then we swap them over at the end. And one of the greatest factors affecting student engagement is this notion of transparency. It's no longer prudent to have your own equipment hidden away so no one else can access it or see it when we should be leveraging and capitalising upon this equipment to create the excitement for the students because when they see something they've never seen before, they stop, they stand, they look at it and they're really, really enthralled in it. 
But the transparency also extends to oversight of the areas. So in an area like this that we would deem high risk, we've now got, this picture's taken from a staff office, we've got great oversight through almost the entire space. So we can minimise risk, which means we can do activities that once were quite risky in a far better way. And conversely, the, the opposite is true, where we've now got students who can go and see technical support far easier than they ever did in the past. They're not locked away, they're in big glass rooms so we can find them. But not all rooms can be made flexible. And I think anyone who's had anything to do with a room like this, which is a preparation or chemistry room, will understand the infrastructure required and the costs associated. Yet even with, with this room, with great design, we've been able to make it as flexible as possible by using the same furniture we've used in the outer area. Everything integrates. We're now seeing some underbench units here used as bench tops or workspaces, and all of that can be reconfigured. So even in that space, we've been able to develop some form of flexibility. But just like space, not all equipment can be made mobile. So large devices like these requiring fixed foundations have still been incorporated into the design, but they've been consolidated into an area that minimises the impact on other spaces. But even then, you can still see the room for flexibility. So although we haven't got furniture in there, you can get a sense of how you can reconfigure these spaces to run several activities at once. So whether it's these large material testing machines, this medical robot, or these absolutely magnificent manufacturing centres, each of them has been positioned as a fixed device but is made completely transparent by lots of glazing and in fact if you want to see the engagement the student get you only need to go to the foyer of O-Block and see the video screen that they've put there. You see the students walk past and it's getting a live feed off these machines. So now the students are stopping, looking, wondering, talking to each other about what the machine's doing. They're never going to get a chance to use it but it might be the only time in their career they ever get to see something like this happen. And we've got the facilities and now we're starting to leverage them. Now the transformation for this flexible delivery approach has meant we've had to transform and revolutionise the entire fleet of our teaching equipment. So all of these things which are on wheels we can now move from space to space, but the important thing is to know where QUT is in relation to the development and the disposition of this type of equipment. We've now had our staff help with the design of these, they're now becoming custom lines for those particular manufacturers and QUT is leading the way with these sort of devices. So it's a really nice place to be at because the manufacturers keep coming back how is it? What would you like to change? Is it working well? But perhaps one of the most exciting rooms in all of the redevelopment is our smallest. This is our rapid prototyping facility. And for those who don't know, this is, we now have the ability to manufacture genuine real parts by layering or slicing plastic or some sort of polymer resin on top of each other very quickly. We've got to be careful of the word rapid because what is rapid to me from a manufacturing background of three to four days is not a student's idea of rapid in two to three <laughs> seconds. Um, however, if, if we look closely at these machines, you'll get a sense of how they work. So the white material in the middle is uh, the part we're manufacturing. And the, the greatest thing about these machines is the accessibility. So students can use virtually any computer that's at QT now with software on it or download free software to create a solid model of any part they want. They send it to us and we slice the model into hundreds of little slices. We put it on the machine and press print. It's not quite file print, but it's very close, and this thing goes off and prints. And the, the outcome is absolutely spectacular. So what we're looking at here is five complete heart pumps ready for the researcher to go and use. These aren't toys, these can actually be used. They hold water, they hold pressure. And although we're not implanting these ones, we just printed five scaffolds to be implanted in Pig in Germany last week. So you can use, depending on which machine and which equipment, the technology is available. And for this particular talk, we're talking about what is it that we can engage our students with. In the past, we would get the students to go to a workshop and tie up a lot of staff's time manufacturing these sorts of components versus now we can print them on these sorts of machines. We can get group students in groups to talk with each other. And if they do talk to each other and they get their models right, then the parts all work. This is something we haven't been able to do in the past, yet the machines aren't costly and now it's a capability that QUT has. So the spatial transformation was significant. But equally significant was what happened at the activity level. So to understand this, we need to go back a little bit in time. Historically, each activity at the laboratory would have been designed for a particular unit running. Now, that unit would use their device or their activity they were running, and when they were finished, the door would be closed, it would go dark, and they wouldn't open again for 12 months. And that's a tremendous waste of opportunity and space. So the answer, therefore, was to extract all of those activities out of all of the units and promote them at the highest level so any academic could select any of those and run it for any of their units. So here's a quick example. 
If I was a new academic and I was interested in the medical engineering field, then I would select from a, a medical domain and I would see several activities that have already been designed, already have paperwork, already have the lab notes and tell everything we need to do about that activity. The academic would select it, timetable it, and then it would be run. Conversely, if you wanted a new activity, then we could put a new one on here, type it up, add all the lab notes, and then everyone has access to this information. So this is really expanding upon that notion of one university, that things are available to absolutely everyone everywhere, and it's all on a really transparent, accessible interface, which is a really unique function. So this is what it looks like in reality. Our motorsport facility that used to be hidden in the bowels of L Block has now been put front and centre. So as well as providing fantastic exposure for these guys, we're now running undergraduate experiments in with them. So that means we're getting undergraduate students seeing real world automotive programs. And that's a, that's a real niche for us. We've never had that ability to do that before. You get a sense here of the visibility. So what this is creating between spaces is the ability for students to see things happen outside of their normal realm, things they would never see happen before. So we now get civil engineering students seeing what mechanical is doing, or avionics seeing what hydraulics is doing, and that's really important. Equally important is some of the funny interactions you have between the students, the demonstrators and the furniture. You might set it up before class and when you come back you wonder what's happened in the area. But it's worked really well for them as each demonstrator operates slightly differently. And some of the greatest things that have happened have been those that were totally unplanned for. What we see here is our surveying students set up in a loading dock area and now, do, now they're doing internal building mapping. So they've put a whole series of targets in through these big spaces and they're doing an activity they've never been able to do before. It's not replacing anything else. They still go onto field or over to the garden uh, campus and do their surveying. But this is an activity that's now added to what they used to do. And you can see even while they're doing that, we've got a large class running in the background. Um, the facilities have also become increasingly important for organisations outside of QUT. So here we see a class from South Bank Institute running where we've got one of our technicians running a civil engineering class. This is important because these are the students who are feeding into QUT through an alignment program. So we're already able to capture them and give them a taste of university life before they've even come in. But for me, arguably, this is probably one of the best pictures that grabs the essence of laboratory learning. So we've got a demonstrator, who's the chap on the right-hand side with the paper in his hand, standing back, his hands off, yet he's letting the students truly experiment. And the students are running through a series of complex experiments, so they're only supported by the fantastic gear, and it's really important to have good gear. But you can see from the body language, they're perplexed. Two of them are looking at the gear, two are looking at their notes, but it's, they're absolutely engaged in this activity. Yet the demonstrator's av available and accessible but he's not becoming obstructive. And that, that, for me, captures the essence of what we're talking about for engagement. Now, equally impressive have been the ways in which we've been able to deliver or our delivery methodologies. So instead of running units or classes for four to six people, we're now seeing some academic visionaries run classes of 90 students with three demonstrators in a quasi-tutorial practical. Now, that's a really interesting concept. And again, when you see the fluidity of these things run, the students moving the furniture and moving it to align to their activity, you can get a sense here that there's not too many people who aren't engaged. You can see just about everyone's focusing on what's happening, yet they've moved everything to suit their own requirements for that class. And increasingly, these spaces obviously open up some fantastic opportunities for competitive environments where an, op an